Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, morning, or evening, wherever you are around the world, and welcome. I am the mental wellness warrior, Annette Chiappe, and I'm here to share an amazing story with you today with my guest. And I'm going to first run the intro. So sit back. I hope you have a beverage, and I'll be right back. Hello and welcome back everyone. Hi Yvonne, how are you? Hi, I'm wonderful. How are you doing? I'm great. Um, help me pronounce your last name. Sandomir. Sandomir, okay. Yes. So um, Yvonne is with us today. As uh, most of uh, you know, I have been slowly moving over to talking and um, working on helping the ending the stigma around mental illness and part of which affects us so deeply for a lot of men and women is sexual abuse. So this past year, though, sorry, from the beginning of this year, I've been <laughs> starting to focus more on how to communicate, how to um, explore the delicate issues around sexual abuse and the healing and what's involved. And that's why we've invited Yvonne on she has written a wonderful book called The Invisible Girl, as uh, she has um, wandered through a maze of injustices and exploitations. So she's going to share a little bit about her story, her journey of uh, parental betrayal. And she's also going to share with us what she's been doing to get the awareness out there about what... Uh, what sexual abuse survivors go through and some of the early signs, warning signs around that. She's also an excerpt reader and I, uh, a life coach as well. So Yvonne, yes. tell us a little bit about yourself, please, as much as you can share. Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, you're right, it is so important to end the stigma surrounding um, mental illness because um, as many of you know, especially when it, it comes to um, child sexual abuse, you know, this mental illness that's uh, that we deal with is thrust upon us um, due to these traumas and not something that we're born with. Um, so I grew up in a very dysfunctional um, family, very abusive family. My father was a raging alcoholic who was brutally um, violent and beating my mother um, along with my brother. He did not beat me, but he um, he neglected me in other ways. Um, at the age of four, I experienced um, my first trauma, sexual trauma, when I was molested by a family member. And this one incident really kind of changed my life because not only because of the trauma, but what happened afterwards. Um, that particular trauma at four years old, I was able to escape. I ran to my mom's house, banging on the door, mom, 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 let me in, let me in. And he chased after me and he caught up to me and threw me over his shoulder and brought me back. And my mom opened the door and I reached my arms out to my mom and I said, Mama, Mama, help me, help me. And she shut the door in my face. My mom did not help me. My mom did not heed my calls for help. I was telling her, I need help. Something is wrong. And she later explained to me that she thought that we were just horsing around, you know, she didn't realize anything was wrong. Um, but I'm here to tell you, if you see your four-year-old child screaming, help me, help me, that's not horsing around. You know, that's a child in need of assistance. Yes. And that first trauma is the very first 
parental betrayal that I experienced. And sadly, that betrayal has continued on my entire life, even now in adulthood. So from, <clears throat> from four years old, um, you know, I have a block of memory, block of time that I don't remember, which is between five and eight. And um, after that, traumas really started piling up. It was, you know, starting really at the age of nine um, with people fondling me, different family members, different family friends. Um, this wasn't just one person. It was multiple people. Um, and from it was trauma after trauma, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, I had trauma, different traumas, types of traumas. The sexual traumas were all from different people. So I endured a lot of sexual abuse and a lot of neglect. I wasn't supervised. My parents didn't watch over me. I was given freedom. I could just do whatever I wanted to do. And, you know, for parents out there, you need to know who's around your children. You need to know who your children are playing with. You need to know who the neighbors are. You need to know, you know, everyone around you. But the crazy thing is, in my childhood, all of these people that hurt me were all people that my mom brought around me. These weren't strangers. These weren't people that I met at a grocery store who took me behind the building and harmed me. These were people that my mom brought to our home, that my mom was friends with family members. Um, at one point she brought home a hitchhiker and allowed a hitchhiker to live with us. And it just, he raped me. I'm just gonna say it, he raped me. I was nine or 10 years old when that happened. And Richard here is absolutely correct talking about it shouldn't happen to any gender and that's kind of not even kind of that is one place that i want to amplify voices are the boys out there that have been abused yeah. um, it's w one in three girls and one in five boys will be abused by the time they are 18 years old and yeah. we have to stop the misconception that boys can't be molested or boys can't be um, preyed upon, you know, because, you know, I, to be honest with you, I had a conversation with my dad today who said, yeah, I went to a concert when I was 17 with a, with a 33 year old. And I was like, wow, 17 and she was 33. And I said, wow, that's not okay. And he was like, ah, for me, it was okay for me. I was 17. I puffed my chest out. And the thing is, it's not okay. It's not okay for uh, a boy. And it's not okay for a girl. It's not okay for anyone to be taken advantage of. So he's absolutely right. I'm sorry. I just had to comment on that when I saw that come up. <laughs> um, so, you know, th that gives you an idea. I have, a, you know, just a lot of a lot of trauma that I've had to deal with, and I had to deal with it on my own. That's my dad speaking to my dad. Come on, Mary. He must have heard me. No, I, um, I, t I totally understand what you what you um, have been there. I am I am also a survivor of sexual abuse. That's that's why this year I I moved away from my show last year as a um, self-care warrior. I am still a self-care warrior. I do everything around self-care. And um, being a sur survivor, I don't even call myself a survivor anymore, being a past victim to sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. um, our stories are very similar. So mm -hmm. um, that's why this year I'm focusing really deep on 
sexual abuse and incest and all this because it affected me from a very young age. And I have the same window as well as yourself that the age of five to about nine, I don't have any memories, right? Ah. The mind just kind of shut down. Yeah. And when I did my therapy, it, a lot of stuff came up. So did um, your, your book, does it go in to the story about everything? Yes, it does. My story, it details everything. Um, and that was really important to me because, yeah. you know, I have been silenced or I had been silenced for 35 years. I didn't really start healing until my mid thirties. And it was important for me to say all of the heinous, disgusting, unthinkable things that have happened to me because they happened to me. And, yeah. and I'm not going to sugarcoat what happened to me to make it easier for other people to read or for other people to understand. You can't yeah. sugarcoat sexual abuse. You can't. Mm -hmm. I will no. tell you that I'm very careful about details. I'm, you know, I'm very thoughtful. I'm, you know, um, it doesn't go into, um, what's the word? Like really, I can't graphic. think of Thank you. Graphic. Thank you. <laughs> graphic. <laughs> I can't yeah. think of the word. Well, there's, there's really no need for the graphics, right? I mean, oh, well, it, well, right, for, right. yeah, for me, it's been always like I had, I did my first sh deep show with a gentleman last week. Mike was on and he had been sexually abused and he's such a huge advocate as well for everything. And, um, uh, my first chat with him sort of triggered me and where I am today is the, I have the ability to, to cope with those triggers. So I wanted to ask you when you, you have some YouTube videos about signs and signs and symptoms. Oh yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned the one about your the child's yelling for help and then the mother doesn't help. And I'm so very sorry that happened to you because you know, I was a teen before I kind of, like my parents went to their grave without knowing. Wow. So, But I, I kind of tried to voice, you haven't done anything for me, but it was so arbitrary that they didn't know what I was talking about. Right. But right. what other signs and symptoms do you, do you know of? Because I, I would love to refer you also to another lady that I know in Israel that helps people. And I think you guys would make a great connection as well. Oh, I would love that. Thank you. Um, yes. So, you know, really for me, I've had signs and symptoms my whole life. I just didn't realize it. I didn't realize they were signs and symptoms until I got into therapy and I really kind of started processing things. So as far as that goes for me, I was acting out sexually. Mm -hmm. I was, and I realized now I realized that I was doing that because I needed to feel loved. Yeah. And because I had been sexually abused my entire life, that is the only way that I felt or the only thing that I was good for. You know, that was the only way that I could show my love or that I was good enough for someone to express their love to me. To me, that was the way that you expressed love. Right. Sexually. And sexually. Right. So yeah, I, I went through something very similar. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was unfaithful in my relationships. I, um, you know, I was self-harming. I was isolating. I was so depressed at home i mean my house was unclean when i was an adult you know i i laundry would pile up i i couldn't do it i just couldn't i didn't have the energy but when i realized that i had to get help is i stopped showering i stopped um, brushing my teeth. I basically spent a good two months in my bedroom, two to three months in my bedroom. And How old were you in this, when you went through this? I was in my thirties when this happened. So yeah. from, 
you know, teens into early 20s was the very promiscuous stage, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for that validation in all of the wrong places. But also, I had nightmares every single night, terrible nightmares yeah. every night. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would have flashbacks, you know, just driving down the street, I would just have flashbacks would hit me and I'd be like, what is going on? You know, this stuff yeah. would it wasn't surfacing before. Now all of a sudden, you know, it's surfacing. And um really just really hated myself. I really internalized all of that pain and I became so depressed. And because what happens, and I know that you know this, you yeah. know, we, we blame ourselves, right? So here I am, all of this stuff right. is coming back to me. And I'm thinking about, you know, when I was 13 years old, babysitting, or 12 years old, actually, babysitting for a neighbor. And, you know, he abused me, but I kept going back. And I was like, why would I keep going back? Why did I keep going back? And it was because I didn't know any better, you know? I, at that time in my life, all of the per, the previous abuses had been one-time occurrences. And yeah. The person never did anything again. And I think when I was 13 and that happened, I thought, oh, well, he did it. He, he did it once, you know, he got away with it and he'll never do it again. You know, that's why you keep going back. People don't keep going back because they think that the, that the abuse is going to happen. They keep going back because they don't think it's going to happen again. Yes. You know, they don't realize that it could be repeated. And so, you know, these triggers and, I, you know, these flashbacks coming back, this self-blame, you know, I would scratch my arms. You know, I attempted suicide. A couple of times. I, I just want to interrupt you. I love Richard's comment here. As a child or teenager, you're blameless. Yes. But we don't feel that way at that time. No, no, we don't. Right. Not at the time. It's like always, now what's, I know. what's wrong with me, right? Right. Now I know. Yeah. Now I know, of course, it was never my fault. It was never me. And it was all of these people around me that did the wrong thing, not me. So why, do you, time. so why do you think, I've always wondered this, so why do you think parents are so blind to this? Or is it because they don't know as well? No. It's because, I think it's a, it could be a number of things. One, it's because it's intergenerational and it's just something that's been passed down for years and years and years and generations and generations. Yeah, I know that's the case in my scenario. Same with me. Yeah. Two, you have sometimes you have parents who are too selfish to understand that a child's abuse has nothing to do with them and is all about the child. So yes. they want to be in denial. It wasn't that big of a deal. You know, it you know, the the parents who essentially minimize and re traumatize their kids because right. they don't get them the help that they need. That's how you're going to react in the situation, right? right? Either you're going to be a responsive parent and say, okay, this is, uh, you know, unacceptable. We're going to do all the right things. But I also think the other thing is there's this huge misconception. I think that parents have that kids are so resilient, especially young kids. That when young kids are traumatized, parents think they're not even going to remember it when they're older. It has no effect on them. I think that's, that's not true. Right. And I think that's a huge mistake that parents make and why they don't seek help for their kid or, you know, get them the therapy that they need or believe. Yeah. yeah Rich, Richard's coming up with a, a lot of good sayings here or, or parents don't want to accept that their friends may be perpetrators and lose friendships that's it 
they're putting, and same thing with family yes they're putting the perpetrators over the kids they yeah. don't want to accept they don't want to accept that their brother molested their daughter they don't want to believe that that occurred it's they're in denial they're in complete denial about it yes. and richard is really he's he has so many great points it's so true but it's it's our duty as parents as the adults to protect our children to supervise our children and to ensure that they're not in situations where this can occur and this is something that i want people to hear yeah my mom made a comment to me now i have to tell you so my mom she has continued to betray me over the years you know after the first incident at four at 13 she remained friends with um someone that hurt me and then a brother that you know just, oh okay we still let's go to thanksgiving with him it's no big deal that kind of a thing um i'm sorry i totally lost my my train of thought because i'm getting off on my mother <laughs> can you tell she's on my <laughs> mind today it's like a, that's she's been, okay she's been upsetting me a little bit lately um yeah because the situation is happening again in our family and she's repeating yeah have you been able to um break the cycle with with them like i did a book called the dance of anger and it's by susan jeffers i believe and that book so helped me clear up the issues of the when they do when you go through therapy and they talk about you know how you have the perpetrator and then Oh, I can't do this off the top of my head right now, but there's, there's a, there's a triangle, right? So yeah. you have the abused, then the perpetrator, and then the person who keeps making the circle go around. Yes. Your mother, your mother sounds like she's in there. She is that person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I have absolutely been able to break the cycle for my own family. You yeah. know, my daughters. Yeah, myself have, as well. Um, my daughters are 18 and almost 21 now and both of them have um have never don't have never you know had an ounce of trauma except for of course the divorce of their parents which we know is traumatic for kids when their parents get divorced yeah. but as far as you know sexual traumas or anything like that i was able to break the cycle um but it's this it's it's the generational intergenerational abuse that's that's really the problem and you know grandma thinks that it's okay because it happened to her you know so then if it happens to the kids then you know they think it's okay and it just goes on and on and on and we have to break this cycle we have to say look it doesn't matter if this is going to upset a friend or a family member what happened to my child is more important than those relationships well the whole biggest thing is how do we do it Right. You give awareness to somebody like them. Okay, yeah. And they're not prepared to take their head out of the sand. There's nothing right? we can do right. about that. Right. So we have to educate the younger generation. Yes, exactly. Right. So, so uh, when my when I was reunited with my children, one of the first things that came up was I asked them right out, were you ever sexually abused? Mm -hmm. Because when I told them my story need to understand why I, we were separated and the whole thing that happened with me was so that they could grasp how mentally ill I was because of my traumas. Mm. Right. It destroys families. Yes. Sexual abuse destroys families. Yes, it does. It does. And you know, really with my children, how I did it was, um, I protected them. I, you know, I didn't, invite strangers over to my house. I didn't let them spend the night out. It's all about being aware. And when I, and when they, they got old enough to talk about when I was going through my depression, I'm very yeah. fortunate that my now husband and my ex-husband, <laughs> you know, we have a really great um, co-parenting relationship. So 
when I was going through my really hard times, my, my husband could call my ex-husband and say, you know, she's really having a hard time. Can you keep the kids for an, an, an extra day or, or an extra two days or whatever? And I would just explain to them, you know, I'm depressed. I think it's important to be honest about what you're experiencing. So if they experiencing it, if they experience it, they're not ashamed of it. So when I'm depressed, I was, I'm really depressed and I want to be better. I just can't be better. But I did get better. And yeah. I really, how I did it was like, I continued on the path and I didn't just tell them that I would get better. I got better. Right. I followed through with my words. You know, I have boundaries with them. I teach them about boundaries. I teach them about, you know, consent. And um, it, it's not okay for, you know, an, a 17 year old to date a 20 year old. That's not okay. You know, and you, it just, you just have to educate, educate. That's all you can do. And it yeah. sounds like you did the same thing, right? Well, I had to educate myself. So when it, it, when it finally came to light for me that why I felt so horrible about life, I, I like I had no clue what depression or anxiety was. Yeah. I just thought that was life. Right. And um, I kept getting into these very dysfunctional relationships, alcoholics specifically, because my father had been uh, an alcoholic. He was a, a pedophile, and that's one of the signs I'd like to point out to people is that I, I remember watching in your video clip, I watched a couple from your web page, that it's not okay to force a child to go hug somebody. They don't want to hug it. That's oh, right. my God. When you said that, I was, like, so happy to hear that because, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I went through agony with the, my father always putting me on his lap and tickling me. Uh -huh. And I just like, I just right now I get like feelings of ants all over me from it. Yes. Yeah. Cause it's so improper for an adult male to insist that a child sit on his lap so that he can tickle her. Right. Right. But where is that line? Like the where is that line where you can see a loving father just being a loving father doing that? Well, see, here's what loving fathers don't abuse their children. Right. So it doesn't. Well, let me ask you something. This is really important because okay. I, I really want to get to the deep core of this. Okay. Did Let's it feel it. creepy when it happened to you? Because when of it course. happened to me, it felt yes. creepy. Yes. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Right. When so I, I think a child, a, a child needs to be taught at a very young age, what, listen to your body, listen to your thoughts. Yes. And why don't think we're teaching children that they're, they're more concerned about what's mommy and daddy going to think if I don't let them touch me. Right. Thank you. You are absolutely right. So first of all, it starts by with boundaries. The one yes. thing is that you don't force your kids to hug anybody not grandma not grandpa nobody not doesn't doesn't matter not even grandma you don't let grandma take your baby's face and you don't do that that's yeah. not you you don't do that <laughs> you know you know i have a granddaughter now she's going to turn one very soon and I watched her with other people and I myself, because I'm, a, a, you know, been through a lot of traumas with sexual abuse. I don't like people to touch me without their permission. So when my granddaughter is with other people and they literally go up and grab her and start like that. And I see her reaction. She's like, oh, like yes. this. Yeah. And she's only like seven, eight months old. No. She's already displaying discomfort of somebody's actions against her body. A thousand percent. A thousand so, percent. So what do you do? As me, as a, a survivor, as a recovered person, 
you go to that Under adult and you say, don't ever do that to my granddaughter again. Yeah, but she thinks it's normal. The people think that's normal. But and what they're this, not understanding right. it's not is that that child is reacting to them negatively. Right. And people have to understand it's not up to them to decide what's normal for your child. Yes. This is your child that we're talking about. And you have to teach your child if they feel any ickiness, that it's okay to express that. And when they express it, we have to act and we have to respond to that. And we have to honor that and say, that's not okay. Yeah. Before I hug, before I hug any of my nieces, nephews, can I give you a hug? If they yes. say, if they say, nah, I'm like, all right, I'll get one next time. Or I'll say, okay, high five this time. Or, you know, you find other ways to show affection because like for instance grandparents that we're talking about yeah the thing is we say oh but it's their grandparents are you still there oh we might have lost yvonne for a minute let's see if she comes back her screen is frozen and i do not hear her <laughs> I'm so grateful that Yvonne is with us here and explaining um, what her feelings and thoughts and experiences are. And um, it's very, very important that we each learn these signs and signs and symptoms. Oh, there she is. Oh, hi. Welcome so back. sorry about that. Oh, I, I don't know what happened. Oh, that's connection. okay. We're so used to it, Yvonne. <laughs> All right, good. I'm back. So, yes. So, if you see your child recoil... First of all, let's, let's just talk about this. If you see your child recoil when someone shows them affection, your child is telling you that they feel ick yeah. when that happens. And kids have to be taught to listen to that intuition and yeah. to trust it. And as parents, we have to look for that and then react to it. So right. when that happens, we may go to grandma and grandpa and say, you know, he really doesn't like hug. So maybe let's just do a high five or, or, or find another way to do it. So they're not so offended because here's the thing. And I actually getting back to what I meant to say before that I totally forgot. My mom would say, well, that person, that person's not a child molester. The thing is, you don't know that <laughs> you don't know that that child that that person is not a child molester so it's not about it's 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 about not putting your child in the situation where it could happen you don't risk your child in that situation it's right you know you don't know that they're it's it's they may not be a child molester but guess what i'm not going to put my child there to find out yeah, My child's not going to be the one to find out. Yeah. Well, it's sort of like that. Um, as my, my, my company is called Learn to Love Myself. And the reason it's called Learn to Love Myself is because I had no idea about my boundaries, my trust, right. my, my innocence. I lost everything because of sexual abuse. I, I mean, I wasn't taught it from my parents. And I didn't learn it. It was very delayed learning about what it meant to be a human being and be safe in the world. Mm -hmm. Like the importance of our message and our stories are so profound. Yes. Because people don't, um, people don't understand how much survivors, victims, or recovered sexual abuse people had gone through or have to go through to become a whole person. I, yes, we're whole per se, but th there is tremendous trauma and it affects every aspect of our life. Um, I wanna interrupt our conversation for a minute because Richard had a question. Okay. And I wanted to answer his question. 
So back a little ways, he said about the age gap here. He says, age thing. So I'm in my 50s. So is it okay for me to date a woman in her 40s and 50s or tail end of 30s? Yes. You know, my view, and you can give your view too, please, uh -huh. Yvonne, about age is this. I have no problem if you're of any age, as long as there's consent. Okay. And consent means it's open. Okay. So say, say there's a 20 year old and he wants to date a 16 year old. Okay. Now there's also legal stuff out here. Right. Okay? Right. And there's also the, the aspect of mental capacity to make a decision. Right. Okay. Right. So if, a 16 year old has the mental capacity to date a 20 year old. Okay. I'm giving you this example because I was in a relationship at 13 with a 17 year old. Okay. okay. Technically speaking, it was rape, Yes. but I ended up rape. marrying that man and having three beautiful children. Okay. okay? So was there consent first? No. Right. Yes. I but, gave him consent to give me sex at, at the 13. level of my mental capacity at that time. At, at 16. Oh, you were 14 at the no, time? No, at 14. I was, I first had sexual relationships at 12 with okay. consent. Okay. But and I knew, no, I knew there's consent. a difference here. I knew I was giving consent. But you didn't okay. consent. You didn't consent because at 12 years old, you're not able to consent. You no, no. In the, there's, there's two. There's two facets here. Okay. One. The first facet. I is, love this conversation. You have the by legal. The way. <laughs> you have, I I have a legal background, so this is really interesting. Yes. I had the. I didn't have the legal timing to give consent. Right. But emotionally, mm -hmm. I gave him consent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mentally, did I give him consent? No. Okay, so two out of three, I gave him consent. So this is where the age thing for me, my understanding is very gray. Yes, and <laughs> it is me, very gray. And for me, so, it's very black and white. And so no, I'm, for me, it's very gray. So and with me, Richard asking about the 50 with a 40 or 30, I say totally go for it because those I, are people who can are of consent with yes. consent yes and they're of the sound they're of the age they have the mental capacity to say yes right 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 absolutely so richard i say if you're in your 50s and you want to date someone in their 30s go for it <laughs> that's what i but say. don't date somebody that's younger than that <laughs> <laughs> no see the way that i look at this is it's about it's about laws, right? Yes, of course, the, 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 the consent, you know, age of consent. But when it comes to keeping the law out of it, keeping the law out of it for a second, the law says that, the law also says that parents can allow their children to have sex with someone who's older than them, right? Which in my mind, that's all child sex trafficking. Just because yeah, a yeah. parent approves of it, doesn't make it okay. And that is child sex trafficking in my mind. So yeah. for me, you're not an adult until you're 18. When you're eight, at 18, you can say yes or no. You can really fully consent, you know, yeah. to what you want to do. And I honestly have no issues. After 18, you know, you, as long as you're 18, if you want to date a 30-year-old, a do I agree with it? No. But at 18, you're legally able to consent to that so yeah. to me, 18 is the age of consent that's it to me so you know talking it kind about of goes into the area of more morality 
Is yeah. it a very is it a moral issue versus a legal issue? Is right. it a um, psychological cap capacity to give consent? There's so many factors, and everyone is uniquely different. Right. Your it's views are thing. different from my views, and it doesn't make it right or wrong. Right. It's just our experiences. Right. So to give you an example, because of all the traumas that I had, you know, at 13, well, I'll say actually at 15, I was dating a 25 year old. Okay. Yeah. And at that time, I thought that I was giving my full consent. I thought that I was in love with this person. But I thought that I was able to make that decision because of all of the traumas that had happened to me. Exactly. Had I, had I not had all those traumas, when this situation occurred, would I have still felt the same way? And because yeah, so much of our emotions and things that happen come from the things that we experience, to say, that at 13, you were able to give consent because you feel like you were mentally or, or emotionally consenting, but you were emotionally broken at that time. Exactly. <laughs> you yes, were and emotionally, I only know that now. Right. You were emotionally broken. So, of if, course, you're actually, going to feel that way towards someone who's making you feel special. Yeah. Actually, this very topic that we're covering, Yvonne, is amazing because it's a sign. It's one of the signs and symptoms. If a girl at the age of 12, 13 wants to have sex, ding, 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 big red flag. Yes. That kid should be wanting to play sports, should be wanting to be exactly. with her girlfriends, going to, you know, doing fun things, not having exactly. sex. Exactly. And so, so let's talk about that as kids. What are some signs and symptoms that you look out for? that something could could have happened first right. of all behavioral changes right. if you if you have a normally mild-mannered child who now all of a sudden just wants to go on a race bike and go 100 miles an hour who would have never done that before you're gonna ask yourself why that change if you have an a student who is suddenly an f student You've got to ask yourself why. If you have um, a, a child who has always loved to go visit so-and-so, and all of a sudden they don't want to be around so-and-so anymore, there's a reason behind it. And you have yes. to figure out what that is. For the younger kids, they may regress to bedwetting, yeah. thumb sucking, that kind of thing. For boys, if you notice that they, if they complain that it hurts to go to the bathroom or it hurts to ride a bicycle, um, you need to look into that. If you have a child who is doing sexualized behaviors that you know it's learned behavior, you know, to give you an example, I watched an incredible documentary called Rewind. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, no. It is amazing. You have to watch it. It's called Rewind, and it's by Sasha Newlinger, um, Sasha Joseph Newlinger. How do you spell Sasha? S-A-S-H-A. <laughs> And he talks about his, his experience. He was abused by um, his uncles. Yeah. And, uh, and it's incredible because it shares his story through home videos of him with these actual people. And you can, oh, see, wow. you can see how he reacts around them. You can see the grooming behaviors in the videos. And... At some point, he started doing things like he would just bend over and pretend like he was putting something, you know, up his butt, you know, and there's video of this. And the mom was like, Sasha, stop doing that. What are you doing? 
that's his way he's trying to show you and tell you what's happening to him so look for things like that if your child all of a sudden starts doing unusual things like that um if if a child um touches another child yeah that is not normal that is not normal sex curiosity it's normal they might want to look oh okay that's right but any touching is because they've been touched before that's learned behavior um you know anxiety depression you know and i anger 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 is a big nightmares nightmares night terrors that those are big ones Um, mine was i was very i was a very quiet person i didn't talk to anybody yeah you isolated yeah and that's another thing um i encourage to take a look at our kids drawings look yeah what our kids are drawing you know um Oh, thank you, Richard. Fan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Richard. I think I should have Richard on our show. Would you like that, Richard? I think Richard? so, too. <laughs> you know, Yvonne, so- I, I want to move towards a little bit more about what it is you're doing because we have about yeah. 15 minutes left. Oh, sure. And I think it's very, yes, you are a brave and courageous woman. I, I'm very grateful that you're out here speaking your truth. Thank you. Um, I, can you share with our our viewers a little bit because I, I, I looked at your web page. I I've looked at your book. I'd love to buy a copy and maybe share a little bit about, you know, how the book came to be, why you're doing life coaching now. Yeah, um, sure, what, sure. What news and events are upcoming with your yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So I knew that I was going to write this book when I was 10 years old. I knew that I was just going through, crazy things that I would write about someday. But it wasn't until I really got into therapy that I said, you know, it really helped me process. It really helped me um, remember things and get them out because so much had happened. But the whole reason that I wrote my book is because this isn't just my story. This is a story of over 42 million other people other survivors who have been through the exact same things that we've been through. And that's yeah. really what inspired me to write the book. And it's funny because when I, when I go and I, you know, appear on these shows, I rarely talk about my book and I talk about the issues because that's what's so important to me <laughs> is the issue. Um, but after writing my book, I realized that I wanted to do more. I wanted to offer more help. Um, and, you know, so I said, you know, life coaches, it's an it's amazing thing that I can do, can really um, impact a lot of people's lives. But what I recognize is that life coaching is not therapy. And people who have been through what we've been through, they need therapy. Um, yes. You know, life coach is wonderful. So I've actually gone away from the life coaching aspect. And I am now focusing on my my own podcast, Survivor Strong, where I invite people who have been abused to come on and share their stories. And, you know, for people who have been silenced, who have never been able to say what's happened to them, I want them to have a platform that they can have someone that's going to be supportive, encouraging, and uplifting, and just tell us what happened to you, because your story I'm- matters. I would love to come on your show. I would love to have you. I would absolutely <laughs> love to have you. So, um, yeah. And so anybody that, that is interested in that, they can go to the website. I have a website for my podcast now. It's www.survivorstrongpodcast.com. Um, and so that's really where I'm, I'm, I'm helping the most right now is, is through the podcast and the people that I've been able to connect with. And it's been very rewarding, as I know that you know. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I moved, I started my career out as an artist, of, of all things. Oh, my God. Because I'm my an- yeah. anxiety and depression, um, what came out from my therapy was a lot of deep things that were both dark and light. And the one, the biggest one was that I love to doodle. 
So I published uh, four coloring books that are for mindfulness. I'm revamping that. everything that I create uh, as mental wellness products and services. Oh, I so, love that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it just came to me like really recently. I or I, I have everything that's inspirational. It's all about being loving, kind and compassionate to yourself, others and the environment. And I've come this way towards sexual abuse because it's something that I've been uh, refusing mm. to acknowledge that I have to bring this experience forward into what I do and being an activist and a philanthropist. I raise money for mental wellness and um, everything is centered around my own experiences. So I got to stop being in denial about my story but it's now with my speaking, I'm doing Toastmasters. So oh. I'm going out more and more in speaking events and getting the message about how mental illness has to move to mental health for mental health and mental wellness. Yes. So the whole steam that's behind it is the traumas, which feed the products and services. So it's, you know, it's like um, the story of, um, what's his name? The one that went in the wheelchair that was Superman, Christopher Reeves. Oh, yes, yeah. And how he had such a traumatic event happen in his life, and he took it as an inspiration to help others. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. Right, right. right. We're helping Absolutely. victims that are, like, maybe currently being abused. Yes. Right? Maybe yeah. a mother is listening to this podcast and going, wait a minute, my child has some of those symptoms. Right. That's right. All right. So it's so important. It really is. And, you know, one thing that I do want to say, how if a, if a child, if a child does disclose abuse to you, how you should react as a parent, the first thing yeah. that you should do is do not react emotionally i know it, it that's yeah. difficult <laughs> um you okay. know I mean, I mean, don't react too emotionally because that can make the child feel like oh no i've now i've upset my my parents yeah. i've told them tell your child i think we need some reason. training classes for people really yes. seriously on both for the children and the parents like yes what's what's wrong with society not being educated on this stuff from the the every single detail needs to be educated i agree a thousand percent i i work with an organization called child help they're based out of california and they have programs that i'm trying to get brought to where i live in florida um mm -hmm. where it it's taught in schools it, that it's a program that schools can purchase that you know of course it's age appropriate for the kids that talks about yeah. these things, you know, that, you know, consent boundaries, what is and is not okay. Um, because you're right. We need training out there because clearly there are a lot of parents who don't know what to do in these situations. Yeah. And because they don't know, sometimes without even knowing it, they can make things worse. Yes. And that is never, you know, not we know that's not the intent of a parent who loves their child you know and it's not their fault because they don't know yeah but now that you know because you don't know what you don't know but now that you know <laughs> that you don't know it <laughs> now <laughs> richard wants to, to know you. if your podcast is on spotify it is it's on spotify it's a live podcast just like this one um that's i broadcast live on on uh facebook and youtube and i do mine through fireside platform i don't know if you've ever heard of it or not um but yes you can find it anywhere iheart radio anywhere that you you know yeah i clicked on i clicked on your links and it took me to youtube Yes, yes, I, I do have a YouTube page as well. Yeah. So, oh, I love what Richard said here. Listen to this. this sh there should be, well, I guess that's there, an AA like group for sex abuse, same for addicts as people who would support each other. You know, there is um, Sexaholic Anonymous. Hmm. I attended it once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a pleasant experience. I did not go no. back. Because but it, sex, I, was, but I wasn't prepared for it. I just wasn't oh, prepared really? for it. But sex yeah. addiction isn't the same as 
sex abuse, right? I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. I don't, you know, I've really loved our conversation. We, you need to come back on. We need to, keep yes, because we can continue. <laughs> I know. Yeah, no, the two of us could go on for hours, I assume. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, absolutely. Um, but there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, l let your viewers know that, um, let the viewers know that we are this, not just survivors, but what would you like to tell the viewers that are still struggling out there? You know, that you got this. I want to tell them we're all in this together. I say this on my podcast every episode. Um, you're not alone. Uh, how you're feeling is normal. It's normal to feel the way that you're feeling and you have every right to feel that way. I would say find a therapist that specializes. Now, this is the important thing that specializes yeah. the type of trauma that you've experienced. Because going yeah, to a that's therapist... Very important. Yeah, going to a therapist who is not specialized could really sabotage your efforts to go to therapy because it might discourage you. And yeah, you know. and that's, that's very good thing. point. Yes. Yeah, that's don't an excellent try, point. Yvonne. Don't just try one therapist either. If you don't like, just keep going until you find the therapist that's for you because I promise you yeah. they're, they're out there. And I would say, you know, your story matters, what happened to you matters. And um, we're just, we're all in this together and you're not alone. Yeah. And if you need help, reach out yes. to someone that you can trust. You can reach out here, even on the Mental Health Warriors. Yes. You know, um, talking to a, a peer who's experienced what you've experienced can make a huge, huge difference because I can listen to Yvonne and Yvonne can listen to me and we can relate. Right. I feel like crying because it's so sad that, you know, we had to go through what we had to go through. But now we are the shining examples of people who can survive this. You know, you had suicide bouts. I've had suicide bouts and we're not just survivors. We are now the future to reach out to younger generations and those still struggling. Right? We're the cycle breakers. Yes. Yes, exactly. We're the warriors. <laughs> yes, we are. We're the warriors. We're the cycle breakers. You know, the thing is, what I, I, I love, what I want people to hear is your trauma does not define you. When you're an adult, you get to do and be whoever you want to be, and you have the power to do it. You just have to find it. It's there. <laughs> you just have yeah. to dig. And, you know, I'm still in therapy twice a week. And I will be for, I don't know how long, and I'm okay with that because I'm learning more and more about myself in this whole healing journey and the process. And that's what it's all about. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly it. You know, it's, um, thank you, Adam. He says, we are both legends. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so if you want to reach, uh, Yvonne, she has her web page. What is your web page again, hon? So for the podcast, it's survivorstrongpodcast.com. If you're interested in my memoir, The Invisible Girl, it's the invisiblegirlmemoir.com. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. And I would love to invite you back. Yes. Like okay. monthly, if I could. To have Let's you do it. Some more and get our get more messages out there. And uh, don't forget, viewers to do self-care if you've been watching and you're feeling a little bit of anxiety rise from this show or you're struggling with whatever mental health issue today please 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 do some self-care whether it's go out and talk to somebody or color which is my favorite yes, thing mine Meditate. too yeah so uh do something to love yourself you are you are okay right so Thank you, everyone, for listening. Oh, we had a late person come on here. I wish therapy was an easy option. I've been begging for help. I'll probably end up topping myself before this year is out. Charlotte, oh. please, 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 we love you. And reach out, reach out, please. Somebody here will talk with you if you need help. 
Charlotte. We, uh, yes. Her name is Charlotte Louise Webster. And she's having a very difficult time. Charlotte, um, please, you can reach out to me, um, yvonne.sandemir at gmail.com. We can just send me an email. Let's talk. And I know also um, that Annette is here for you. We love you. You're needed. Let's talk about this. Yeah. Yeah, we've been where you've been and we've yes. felt the way you felt and only through perseverance and knowing that you you do matter you really do matter and if you just reach out please please reach out to us yeah and um uh say my goodbyes yvonne yes and we'll be in touch again soon sounds wonderful thank you so much Have thank a wonderful you for coming day. on my pleasure bye-bye